This is the year of... Boy, that was so sad. This is the year of... That was still sad. This is the year of... Generosity, and you are... Oh my goodness, you are a generous church. Last year in 2016, I can't wait to hear what happened in 17, but in 2016, you gave $320,000 of a $1.2 million budget. That means you gave almost 30% to house, to bless, to encourage, to strengthen people all over the world. You are a generous people. You are a generous church. And you know, there are a lot of folks that tell me, Pastor, we should just not do as much outreach. And I said, then let's just close close the building and go home. Because for me, this is all about saving souls. Can I hear an amen? Amen. All about seeing lives transform. And whether people like it or not, it costs money to do that. Amen? Amen. So you are, shout it out loud, I am am. the generous church. That is the truth. You know, today we've just, this is my last portion of the series dealing with the season. And the first was the season of forgiveness. Jesus gave us, by coming on this planet, the season of forgiveness. How many of you are glad your sins have been forgiven? Well, I guess not everybody. We'll have, a, we'll have an altar call here real soon. How many of you are glad your sins are forgiven? Yeah. Amen. How many of you are glad that you forgave yourself? Yeah. How many still need to forgive yourself? I have some more hands. Oh, Jesus. How many of you are glad that you were able to forgive somebody? How many of you had to go out of your way and forgive somebody in the last few weeks? How many of you was really tough? How many of you are really free now that you did it? Amen. Isn't it awesome? Last week we spoke about the season of deliverance. How God does not want you bound to anything besides himself. That there are no restrictions and God has blessing for your life. And today I want to talk about the season of great gifts. Do you realize in just a few days we're going to be opening presents around a tree? And I want you to know that this year I think I finally outdid my wife. I'm telling you, you are going to be so excited about the gift that I got you. You're going to be so happy. In fact, I went and took back a gift so I could buy this one. Because I can't wait. How many of you love receiving gifts? You know, everybody says, well, it's better to give than to receive. I don't know. I like the the receiving part pretty good. Pretty good at this. You know what's amazing is our reception from, uh, from the Lord really depends upon how you view him. You know, we did a whole thing, this being the year of the generous church. We started off this year really focusing on this principle, and that was this. Whether you believe in a poor God or a rich God. And the fact is is that most believers, they really honestly believe, we won't say it out of our mouth, but we pray accordingly, we live accordingly, we act according, that our God is poor and poverty stricken rather than who he absolutely is. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords and there is no lack in heaven. How many of you are glad there's no lack in heaven? You see, until you recognize how you view, because how you you perceive is how you receive. If you perceive God as poverty, if you perceive God as weak, if you perceive God as just a religious God, then how you receive from him is very little. Why? Because you don't believe he could actually meet your needs. But when you see your God for who he actually is, high and lifted up, and his train fills the temple, that God has everything, and there is nothing that he cannot provide for us, and that he longs to provide for us, he longs to forgive, he longs to heal, he longs He longs to deliver. He longs to bless you because you're his babies. Now, I don't know about you. I'm so glad my God is not weak. I'm glad my God is strong. The Bible says in James chapter uh, chapter 1, verse 17, I love this verse because it immediately attacks the perception of people. Now, again, many of us believe, and and we won't say it out loud, but we believe in the God of weakness. We believe in the God of poverty. We believe in this God. We won't say that out loud. We live it. And we live it because, honestly, some of you have been trained that way. You've been taught that God is not able to meet your needs. You've been taught that God does not always want to touch you and heal you. You've been taught almost like the the, the roulette wheel of luck within the kingdom of God. And that is the poor God. And I want you to know that he is a miserable God to serve because you might as well be your own God. 
He's unable to meet your needs. But when you truly know the one and true God, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who's, who was and is and is to come, the one God that's high and lifted up and his train fills the temple, when you truly know him in all of his majesty, then you recognize there is nothing that he's not able to provide for you and your family, that God is not only able, he's willing. James chapter 1, verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, from whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. What does the word every mean? All, oh, everything. Every good gift, every single gift that you get from God, not one less, not one more. Every gift you get from God is guaranteed to be, guaranteed to be something specific. Let me show you what it is. Every good the word good there actually literally means excellent, happy, joyful. Every joyful gift that you get, every happy gift that you get, every blessing that you get, listen, it does not come from the devil. It comes from the Father of lights. The Bible says every good and perfect gift. What's the word perfect mean? It means and there's no flaws in it. And what's the word gift? It means a present. It means you can't earn it. Listen. The problem with serving the poor, poverty-stricken God, you are an ugly, ugly God. I'm sorry. Just had to say that. But when you serve the true God, the one thing you'll recognize is this, is that every good gift, every gift that your Father in heaven gives you is not only going to be good, it's not only going to be perfect, it's going to meet your need, and he longs to do this in your life. You know, um, I, I, get, I get really bothered, I guess it will be the right verbiage, mainly because of the lack of either understanding or poor teaching. You know, when people say, well, you know, well, God brought this sickness on me to teach me some spiritual good, well, then that's your God. When people don't tithe, that's your God. Because if God can't meet, come on now, if you can't trust God with your money, you'll never trust God with your soul. Amen. See, it all comes down to how you perceive God to be. And this is the challenge that we have. If every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, then the one thing that you've got to recognize about your, about your God is that the inventory of heaven does not possess a bad gift. You know, you can go to a store and they can have bad inventory. But when you go to heaven, there is no bad inventory. In fact, what I love so much about heaven is this, is that in heaven there is no lack. Watch now. In the Garden of Eden, before there was sin, there was no lack. And God created that for the pleasure of mankind. There was everything that was needed, everything that you desired was in the Garden of Eden. When man sinned, we know that a curse came upon the land. But the one thing that I love about Jesus, he who became a curse for us, became that so that we don't have to experience it. Galatians chapter three, verse 13, and that Jesus came to destroy the curse of the law. Well, what is that? And that is what you didn't have, what you lost in the Garden of Eden, God will restore to you now, and that is not just relationship, but that is that you don't have to have lack. Lack has never been a blessing. Boy, I'm so glad I have, I have nothing. I'm so glad I'm poor. I've never heard a poor person say, I'm glad I'm poor. I've never heard a hungry person say, boy, I'm sure glad I'm hungry. Praise the Lord. Never heard somebody that can't make their bills. Boy, I'm so blessed by God because I can't pay my bills. Never heard that. But what happens is, when we're unwilling to believe who he has called us to be and who he is, then our perception of who he is, we diminish his capability of meeting our every need, which he desires to touch. He desires to release from the heavens, but he cannot release without faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith is believing that what God has for you is for you and that you can obtain it. But what happens to many believers is we slide so much to the flesh because we've been taught incorrectly that we look to God and say, well, you know, you know, if you find it in your heart to help me, I, 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 I wish you'd do that for me. But if you can't help me, I understand, you know, you're grace is sufficient for me. 
And so all of a sudden, you got a bunch of believers that are running around, man, and they're whooped all the time. Why, would, why do you think the people of the world would want the God you serve when he's this? Even the children of Israel, when they left Egypt, the Bible says in Psalms 105, there was not one sick among them, and they took all the money, come on now, they took all the money from the Egyptians. They didn't even walk out of Egypt, not, even, not one of them sick, two and a half million people, but they didn't walk out poor either. You see, our mindset has been so twisted and contorted by religion, and we've got to have a revelation, not the revelation of church, not the revelation of religion, but we need a revelation of our God, and our God is so massive, our God is so grandeur, our God is so great, our God is so powerful, our God is so rich, our God is so good. Man, I tell you something, when you know your God, there's nothing you can't do. Man, that's what I love about him. You know, when you start recognizing how he lives. You know, the Bible calls us the children of God. You know, I was telling you the other week about my granddaughter, my granddaughter's birthday. She's three years old. She's smart as a whip for a three-year-old. And you know what she asked for her birthday? She says, I want a pink car. You know, one of the ones that drives. Well, you know what? If you asked her, and people did, they said, hi, hi, hi uh, Sophia, what are you going to get for your birthday? And, and she would say, a pink car. There was no question in her mind she was going to get a pink car for her birthday. So on her birthday, of course, she got a pink car. So here she is. She's standing over in the corner, and, and uh, Pastor Cody and I carry in the pink car, and we set it down, and people are there with the cameras, and she ran over to the car, got in it, but she really wasn't like, enthralled excited I, I mean at first i thought she was gonna go oh a pink car she was gonna run and jump in the car and hug the car and hold the car she didn't do any of that you want to know why because she knew she was getting the car did she see the car no she couldn't see the car it was hidden she didn't know she was getting it in, in the moment, but she knew in her spirit. Come on now. You see, let, we've got to come to God as little children when we recognize that our God is able to do abundantly above all we could even ask or imagine. You see, God wants us to imagine because she declared those things which were not as though they already were. And man, when she got her car, she was so, it was normal. <laughs> I remember one time, my children, my four and five-year-old, they were, um, I was getting ready to go to the, the Newfield Covered Bridge Market, and they said to me, Daddy, can we have a lollipop with bubble gum in the middle? And I said, sure. So I went to the store, and um, I came back from the store, and, and there the two are. It's a split-level house. They were standing at the top. And when I walked in the door, this is what they did. <laughs> what happened? They knew they, were they knew they were getting it because Daddy said he would. You see, when you recognize how good your dad is, they didn't even question that they were going to get a lollipop. My granddaughter didn't question she was going to get a pink car. Why? Because she knew we were able. And listen, if we weren't able, we would have made it happen one way or another. Because you see, when you recognize how good your daddy is, God is not going to withhold one good thing from those who walk uprightly before him. Psalms chapter 84. Here, let me show you how big your God is. God lives in opulent splendor. The splendor of heaven is amazing. You know, if we could just get a glimpse of heaven, we would all sit back and just gaze at it and its opulence and its majesty and how powerful it is. You see, what's amazing is that God surrounds himself with the most precious gems and the most precious stones. He doesn't even have to go to K Jewelers. Went to K Jewelers and looked at a, see, now I'm going to tell you what my wife didn't get. Because I went to K Jewelers and, and I bought a bracelet last year, a floating diamond bracelet last year. And this year I was going to match that. And, and so I went in there and I, I picked out, I, I, it was a necklace and it was a floating diamond. And I'm looking at it and I said, how much does this cost? And they told me, and I went, oh. <laughs> but for God... 
A diamond is just no big deal. He is surrounded with sapphires. He is surrounded with diamonds. He is surrounded with the greatest of gems. There are diamonds everywhere. It's no big deal. God lives in opulence. God lives in splendor. There is nothing that God does not have. There is no lack in heaven. And gems are nothing. God walks on streets of gold. Man, think about this. For the gates of heaven, they're gigantic pearls. God says, I need gates. Can I have some pearls, please? Can you imagine the size of those oysters? I'm talking, it's one, just one. It's one pearl on each side. They're just massive and, and mo- they're just, just glorious in, in what man can see. God's altar is gold. The candlesticks are gold. The labors are gold. There's no aluminum in heaven. God's throne, as far as you can see, is covered with what? With crystal. There's so much crystal in heaven. There's even a sea of crystal. I want you to recognize this. I'm just trying to get you to see it in your mind's eye, the opulence that your Father in heaven lives in. He's not lacking. He's not poor. He's not poverty stricken. He's not saying, how am I going to keep heaven open? He's not wondering if he's going to make the bills to keep the lights on, for he is the light. Man, he's not wondering if there's ability to keep hell out of there, because he has all authority, and the devil is is already defeated through Jesus Christ. You see, it's so powerful to realize that your God is great and he's not weak and he's not poor. Can I hear an amen? amen? The greatest gift that God gave us was Jesus. How much greater for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We couldn't have got a greater gift than Jesus to have our sins washed away to be able to be called sons and daughters of the most high king. You know, what's amazing is when you start looking at this poor God, this religious God. You see, what's really sad is, well, pastor, I, uh, I go to church, but I don't expect anything from the Lord. I just give him my heart, and I don't expect anything back. You're a liar. How many of you gave your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ? Why? You wanted to be saved. You gave to get how many, of you, uh, how many of you tithe? Why? You give to get. Well, I don't give to get. Yes, you do. You want to be in the open heaven. Can I hear an amen? amen? Everything we do, we give to the Lord. There is a reception or a receiving from the Lord back to us. And God isn't saying, well, you know, you know, Gabriel, I'm, I'm hoping that we got enough in savings to help those guys out. This God over here is saying, well, I don't got enough in savings. You know, in fact, when they start giving out gifts, what you're going to find about this, what do you got there? It's used. (laughs) This God over here, when you start asking for help, he's got to go to the recycling bin. Do I got enough available in the recycling bin? Do I got enough in heaven's quantity to be able to help somebody else? Well, you see, the fact is is that we might not say that, but we live that. In fact, when it comes time for Christmas, many people believe this God to be just like this. He pulls out a gift that he's got to give. And how many of you wouldn't mind a gift this morning? Amen. Ready? So here he is. He goes to the dollar store and said, let me buy a gift for somebody. So he's got more than one person that wants a gift, but he doesn't have enough to make everybody's needs. So uh, he's just going to take care of business. Go ahead. Why don't you go give those gifts out? So the only way for God, <laughs> the only way for the poor, poor God to meet your need is he's got to start breaking the gift up and giving it out piece by piece. Oh, Lord, I need your help. Well, you know, when I get time. Oh, God, I need a healing. I hope you hit the luck, you know, the roulette wheel of love and luck that maybe it's your turn to get healed. Oh, God. 
God, I need my mortgage paid. Oh, God, I need my bills paid. Oh, God, I need a new car. Well, you know, we're just trying to make it up here in heaven, too. You're asking too much. <laughs> You're missing a shoe. No one believed for one. <laughs> you know, I hear a lot of believers say this. Well, you know, God put this sickness on me to teach me some spiritual lesson. This is your God then. Well, you know, God's leaving me in this position and, you know, I, I, I'll just, oh God, you know, you'll help me through, I'm sure. But if you don't, you know, though he slay me, yet shall I serve him. You see, our minds have been so twisted from the truth. And we've got to come back to the truth. The truth is that God has everything that you need. And he has given us the right to be called children of God. Listen, on Christmas Day, like I said, I can't wait. I can't wait for my sons to open the present that I bought them. Why is that? Because I know they are going to love that gift. I can't wait for my wife to open up her gift. I know, I know she's going to love her gift. My daughter, I don't know, I haven't bought anything for her because my wife does all that. But as a parent, I can't wait. Listen, if you earthly parents know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your heavenly Father wants to bless you. We've got to get out of this poverty mentality. We've got to get away from the poverty God. And we've got to come to the King of kings and the Lord of lords who lives in opulence, who desires to bless those who are called his children. I want you to recognize today that you are not weak, but that you are strong. You don't have to just barely make it by. God wants you to go over the top. and. God God has a plan to bless you because you're his favorite child. You see, as King's kids, you know, you, you and I have all seen that. You know, we've seen a, a rich kid. Maybe you're the rich kid in the room. You know, uh, on their 16th birthday, they drive in with a Corvette. Mommy and Daddy bought him a Corvette. On your 16th birthday, you got a huffy. And you looked at the kid with the Corvette and said, yeah, I got a huffy. And the kid with the Corvette said, yeah, I got a Corvette. Do you know what's amazing? Is the kid with the Corvette probably isn't even enamored with the fact that he got one. Why? Because it's normal to him. It's normal because his father is wealthy. It's normal because there's wealth in the house. It's normal because there's no lack. But what happens for those of us who struggle with the poverty mentality, we look at that and we come, become envious where that individual says, well, that's normal for me. God wants to make blessing normal for you. God wants to make divine favor normal for you. God wants to make his outpouring of his spirit, the outpouring of his love, and the outpouring even of blessing things in normal things on this planet a normal thing for you because you're a child of God himself Amen. Revelation chapter 5 verse 10 says this it says as kings and priests you are a king and you are a priest show me a poor king show me a poor patriarch Well, Jesus was poor. Oh, no, I'm sorry. You need to get that CD because at the beginning of the year, I proved that Jesus was not poor. You see, this is that religious mindset that has gotten us to lay hold of this, this poor, poverty-stricken God who can't meet our needs. And we don't pray like we should. We don't live like we should. We don't stand like we should because we don't believe that he's able to back us up. He's able to bless us. He's able to heal us. He's able to deliver us. Yes, he'll save us from our sins, but that's all he's able to do. But I want you to know that God didn't just save you from your sins because if you were just going to be saved from your sins, you'd die when you got saved. But God left you on this planet to live as more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ our Lord. You aren't here to survive. You're here to thrive. You're not here to just barely make it. You're here to go over the top. For if God is on your side, who could ever overcome you? The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, you're called royalty. 
We had a class in a Bible college. It was called etiquette. <laughs> yeah, I didn't do good. They actually taught us and what forks to use and where, where to place the cups and not only just set the table, but the whole facet is if, this is what they say, if you eat with a king, this is how you do it. And it is amazing, you end up eating with, you know, in, in our position, we've eaten with some very high officials, not only in America, but in Mexico. And if you didn't know etiquette, you know, you're sitting at the table, you start burping and passing gas, it don't work. In fact, it gets right down to when I went through coaching, training, one of the things that they taught me was, it's the pen you use when you sit before a king, actually the king then determines whether you have kingship or you are royalty or whether you are poverty, even by the writing instrument that you pull out to sign a piece of paper with. It's amazing how we've just gone into survival mode as believers, and Christ didn't call us to be survival mode. He called us to be examples on this planet. He called us to be people that as he blesses, listen, the children of Israel, the Ites did not like them, but the one thing the Ites always recognized, for those who don't know what the Ites are, the Jebusites, the Zebusites, the Isites, the Uzites, and the Huzites, and the, oh, that was the Whoville. I mean, we got all those Ites. All the people coming against the children of Israel. But one thing the children of Israel, they were always recognized for, was God was with them and God was on their side. And they always lived with great blessing. You see, when they lived under that open heaven, they always had the blessing of God. That open heaven is a key to your life. I'm almost done. John chapter one, verse 12, you are children of God. Romans chapter eight, verse 17, you are heirs of God and joint heirs of Jesus Christ. An heir means that when you get to heaven, you get all the heaven has, but a joint heir means this. As a joint heir of Jesus Christ, it says this, whatever Jesus has, you have. Where's Christ? He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. What does Christ have? There's no lack that Christ has. That means you and I don't have to live in lack. Can I hear an amen? The Bible calls us, Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, citizens of heaven. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, you are ambassadors for Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 37, you are more than a conqueror. You aren't a conqueror. You are more because Christ Jesus already paid the price and already whooped the devil. Mark chapter 9, verse 23, there's nothing impossible if I believe. Psalms 84, 11, no good thing will I withhold from those who walk uprightly before me. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I don't know about you, man. For years I was indoctrinated by the religious folks of the denomination that I was participating with. And man, when I started getting so frustrated, I started going to the Bible and I started realizing how great my God is. How my God can't wait to heal me. How my God can't wait to set me free from bondages and sins that I struggle with. How my God can't wait to bless me with finances. How my God can't wait so that I can have more than enough so that I can give to every good Good need that comes in front of me. How my God can't wait to bless me in my ministry and my calling and my purpose. How my God can't wait to bless my family and my children. How my God, I can't go, I can go on for weeks. How my God can't wait to bless me. When I started realizing that, my prayers changed, my beliefs changed, my position changed, how I talk changed, how I walk changed. You see, actually, this is what they teach physiologically, and that is how you hold your body to also shows who you believe you are. They actually did a test, and uh, it was very interesting. They took an individual, and they started tearing down this individual for about 10 or 15 minutes, telling them they were worthless, telling them that they had no value, telling them just breaking them down, telling them that they were idiots, so on and so forth. By the end of that time, that person literally, physiologically, was slumped over. You see, how you hold and posture your body determines who you believe you actually are. People said to me, well, you know, that Spencer, he's just, he's just so pompous and he's just full of himself and that pastor, he's just so proud. You know what? I'm not proud. I just know who I am. 
You see, I can walk with my head high and my shoulders back. I can put a step in my gate because I know who's for me. And I know that no matter what, I can't fail. I know that no matter what I put my hands to, shall prosper. I know that if God is on my side, my tree will always produce fruit and I will have no lack in my life. How do I know that? Because my God said that. And my God has that available. My God is willing and he is a great God and greatly to be praised. See, how you view God changes everything. If this is your God, you're always in lack. You're always wondering when you're going to break through. You're always hoping that you're going to get healed. But when you serve this God, you know his will for your life. And though hell, come on now, let's be real. We've all gone through hard times. Can I hear an amen or oh my? You see, your faith is only theory until it's tested. Let that sit for just a second. Your faith is only theory until tested. The times that it gets so hard that you're not sure if you're going to survive, that's where your faith is actually tested. Where you actually say, you see, the words of your mouth, they're either life or death. You see, you start to declare in prayer what you actually believe. And all of a sudden, it's not, oh God, just get me through this. It's, oh God, I thank you that I'm already through this. For if God is for me, who can be against me? I thank you, God, that I can't fail no matter what the problem is. I thank you, God, that you have a divine drop of wisdom somewhere that, Lord, the one thought that I have to have that will bring me over the top, you're going to provide it. Lord, I thank you that God if I need money, you are the one who can bring the wealth of the wicked to the righteous. You are the one, oh God, who can make a way where there is no way. God, I thank you that I cannot fail. You see, when you understand this, it becomes more than just a philosophical mindset within church and religion. You know, the building you're sitting in, we're celebrating 10 years this year. 10 years. In this building. When I, when I was going to buy this building, actually, when I was going, we were going and, and to build this building, we went to all these banks. We found a builder. The builder would build it for $700 and some odd thousand dollars at $25 a square foot, which in and of itself is a miracle. If you know anything about building, this building should have cost us $125 a square foot, and the builder was going to build it for $25 a square foot. Well, you can have a builder who's going to bless you all you want, but without the 700 and some odd thousand, in fact, to actually build this building with the land and so on and so forth, it costs one, $1.1 million. Should be almost $4 million. And so even though we had this phenomenal blessing, here I am with a reality. You see, if I believe in the recycling God then I'm going to hope that I get enough. No, I probably not. That's a lot of money. Not only that, is we started going to banks. So we went to three different banks. You know what they told us? Listen, you're too young. Your church is too young. You have to have at least nine years under your belt, minimum nine years. And listen, you got to have a minimum of 30% down if you're going to do anything. If we're even going to work with you, 30% down. You know what that means? You have to have over $300,000 in cash. I think we had maybe 10000 in the bank. And so it would have been easy for me to just to say, well, you know, I guess it's not God's will. I, I guess it's not going to happen, you know. I guess, you know, this isn't going to happen. You know, I, I just, it was just a good pipe dream, you know. Whatever. No, I want you to know something. I don't believe in this God. I believe in the God where there is no lack and there is no impossibilities. I believe in the God who will bless me abundantly above all I could even ask or imagine. And this is what I said. I said, I don't know where the money's coming from, but this one thing I know, that it's God's job to bring the finances, and God's going to open the opportunity. We went to, I, I got a call one day, and, and the call was, hey, you know, I found there are three banks in America that build churches. Only one of them work with churches under $2 million. You should give them a call. I called the man, Mr. Dusterman is his name, and I said, Mr. Dusterman, you know, we need a mortgage to do this building. We got a phenomenal deal, walking in with equity. He said, that's really nice. I send me your monies. And so we sent, you know, we sent them the books. And he said, well, Brother Spencer, you know, that's really close. I mean, are you really sure you're going to be able to make it? You're, you're, I mean, you're not, like, you're not like really, like really making it here. 
I said, brother, I just know this. This is what God told me to do, and this is what we're going to do. If you don't help us, the money's coming from somewhere because he's a God with no lack. He looked at me, and he said this. He said, you know what? I'll do it. How about $10,000 down? I said, sold. (laughs) Ten years later, we've been in this building. Well, why? Because, you see, if your pastor believed in the God of lack, then I would have given up, and we would be in a small, you would, in fact, you would not be here today. Many of you would never have been in this building. Many of you would never have been in this church. You had never have come. You would never have been saved. You would never have been filled with the Holy Ghost. You would never have been healed. Why? Because we would have been a little small building down the street that only holds like 300 people. But, you see, I know my God, and this is what you've got to get a hold of. There's nothing he can't do. He longs to bless you. Oh, but pastor, I'm even struggling with this and this in my life. Then stop changing. Stop looking at your struggles. Stop calling upon the dead worship God that can't provide for you. Get a hold of the King of kings and the Lord of lords who is able to bless you abundantly above all you can ask and imagine. Now listen now, that means you've got to be a tither because that's open heavens right there. But not only that, is that means that you are positioned to say, Father, this is your job to take care of me. I love this. I'll end with this verse. And you saw a miracle this morning. Under 30 minutes. Matthew 7, 11 says this. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? You see, today, you serve one of these gods. You serve the poor, weak, pathetic, poverty God? Or you serve the one true King of kings and Lord of lords where there is no lack and there is no impossibilities? And today, if you are serving the poor, weak, poverty God, then you need to make a change in your life. The Bible says, let this mind be in you which is in Christ Jesus. You want to know why Jesus didn't have a problem asking the Father for anything? Because he knew he'd get it. Just like, just like baby Sophia. She knew she'd get it. You see, you've got to make a decision. It makes a direct impact on your, on your daily life. Honestly, there's nothing that I want that I don't get. My children are witness. My wife is a witness. Those around my life are a witness. Anything that I've ever wanted, I get. Well, why is that? Because I'm spoiled. You see, I know who my God is, and I know that he's able to do that, and I know that he wants to bless me. So whenever I've wanted anything, I've just put my faith in that direction, and I've called those things which are not as though they already are, and I started laying hold of the promises that are in the book. When I've been sick, when my wife was diagnosed with cancer, we had to lean upon this God, not this God. Time and time again, this is so real to us. And every one of us make a choice which God will serve. And today, which God do you serve? See, you can't be depressed and serve him. You can't live in discouragement and serve him. The only way you can live in those zones is when you don't believe that God is able to do abundantly above all you could ask or imagine. Who's your God? Who's your God? Close your eyes with me this morning. See, the one principle that you know that you have to lay hold of is this. One of the greatest promises of God is giving Jesus. And Today, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the great God wants to give you forgiveness of every single one of your sins. No matter how bad you think you were, no matter how evil you used to live, the one thing for sure is this, is that Jesus loves you so much, he wants to forgive you. He longs to forgive you. He's after you. In fact, right now you feel him drawing you in your spirit. 
You might not even know what that is, but I just identified it for you. That's God drawing you, saying, listen, this is for you. I'm here for you. I'm here to forgive you. I'm here to change your life. The generous forgiveness of Jesus. Today, if you do not know Christ and you're not sure if you're going to go to heaven if you take your last breath, and you want to be sure beyond a shadow of a doubt, you want to be called the son and daughter of God, you want to be the son, the heir, the joint heir of Christ, you want that for your life. You deserve that. Jesus paid for that. Today, if you want that Christ in your life to be your Savior, I'd like you to slide your hand up right now. I'm not going to manipulate you. Thank you. Thank you both right there, ladies. You can put your hands right back down. Thank you. Is there anyone else this morning you want Christ Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior? I'm not going to wait long. Come on. Five. Come on. Four. Three. Come on. Get your hand up. Three. Two. Thank you. Young lady. You can put it right back down. Is there anyone else? Two. Last call. And one. Let's all stand to our feet.